Thanks everyone for tuning in for the special Q&A. Um, I am honored and pleased to be joined by director, artist Rob Roth uh, and Debbie Harry, both from the film Blondie, Vivir and La Havana, screening as part of this year's New Orleans Film Festival. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. My, yeah, my pleasure. Um, I wanna start with um, something of an obvious question or it's obvious to me, but um, I'd love to hear the origin story of y'all's collaborative partnership. Um, I know you've been friends for years and you've worked together in a variety of ways, but how did this, how did this come about? Well, well it actually came about from, uh, from Jackie Sixty, the, the club that um, Johnny Dinell and Chichi Valenti uh, originated. And um, Rob used to make these little loops, video loops, that, that repeated themselves over and over and over again, in, you know, at the club. And uh, I just was fascinated with them. And I thought they were just really interesting and, and beautiful and well done. And, and so I, I asked about them. And then I, I think um, socially, you know, just from being around, I don't know, is there anything more specific, Rob? Oh, that you pretty much said it. Yeah, <laughs> we. I always just say we met at the club. <laughs> That's a great response. And took a Actually, Debbie, I will. I will add to that is that Debbie, one of the very very first things that we actually did together was for the the other night that I did there called Click and Dragon. She kindly became my Gibson girl, which was a theme we did one Saturday that combined William Gibson. And the Gibson girl of who is that? The the illustrator, the turn of the century illustrator. So anyway, Debbie kindly was the model for that video, and I made one of those loops of her, and that was kind of the beginning, I think. <laughs> yes, we've been loopy ever since. <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> Years of loops. Well, tell me about the um, the film's origin story. I mean, obviously you've been working together, you've known each other for years. How did the film itself, um, whose idea was it? How did it come about? I can speak just that uh, what I've said before is this is the first thing that I ever pitched them, meaning most of the things Debbie and, and Blondie and I have done together are usually, oh, they come to me, we need this, or here's the music videos. This, when I found out that they were having this opportunity and that they had never been there, it was the first thing I said to them and the management, like, I really think we need to document this. So, you know, and Debbie can, can talk about how that um, opportunity came about as far as the going there, but I knew I had to document it. Well, I, I can't really document or say anything because uh, I wasn't really deeply involved in the planning. Uh, Tommy Manzi, our manager, you know, really orchestrated and engineered the whole thing. And, um, you know, we just gave the, uh, you know, the approval, I guess, to, to do it. Uh, you know, Chris had always wanted to go there. Unfortunately, he didn't end up going, but, um, you know, it was, it was a, a shared dream and uh, a great curiosity and, and feeling that we had for Cubans and Cuba and Cuban music and, um, you know, it, it just sort of worked out and it was part of the, uh, a cultural exchange program. And, uh, we had the opportunity to work briefly with, um, some Cuban, uh, musicians and, uh, they joined us on stage to do a couple of songs, um, both for both shows. And, um, you know, uh, I, I feel very fortunate to have actually had this opportunity in addition to the fact that, you know, Rob organized, you know, the, this uh, nice piece of film and, and that, you know, we got to bring it another, another step into reality, a bigger reality, which is, you know, very nice. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. Debbie, because, um, I mean, in the film you talk about, uh, you almost feel like you'd been there before. You say as you're walking along the harbor, it's as if you'd, you know, been to Cuba before. And I, I'm curious about what those, you know, metaphysical connections to that place mm -hmm. were. Like, what was really pulling you there? Um, like, what kinds of 
spiritual other forces were drawing you in. And also curious, would love to hear from you, Rob, too, if you felt something similar about, about Cuba. Okay, Rob, go. <laughs> well, it's funny, that's actually a great question specifically for New Orleans, because it's a very similar feeling I had the very first time I went to New Orleans, which was in 1988. I, I had felt like I had been there before. And I believe that certain places are, I call them haunted. Now, I don't know what that exactly means, in, but it is in a metaphysical sense where, and I don't know what I believe if I've in past lives or anything, but I just feel like certain places have certain energies, I think, or certain um, I think also that they're port cities. I think port cities are very, coming from New York, you know, I think there's something familiar there. But when I went, I also felt similar um, in Cuba. I don't think as strongly as Debbie, I don't know if I felt like I'd been there before, there was something familiar, but I, I got that the first time I went to New Orleans and every time I go back, I get the same feeling. Well, I, I agree. There is there are certain places in the world that you go to that have, um, for whatever reason, they've developed it over time for the, the kind of people that have gone there or, or, or worked there, uh, a true sort of magnetic presence. And it, and it does it does linger. And I'm sure that there is some, you know, geological um, uh, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Some kind of, you know, uh, physical manifestation of this that is actually, you know, because of the nature of the planet and how we're spinning and so on and so forth, that there are magnetic ports and portals and so on and so forth. And, and as Rob said, you know, it's a, you know, it's a port city, you know, and, and port cities like uh, New York, New Orleans and, and Havana, um, a lot of people go there, you know, there's always something happening. It creates, um, I, I, my sister always says this, she says it creates a whirlwind. And I, I always say, no, it's not a whirlwind, it's a whirlwind, but it could be a whirlwind <laughs> too. So, um, you know, for, for what it's worth, you know, this is how I think it's affected us or, you know, in our creative, you know, sort of willfulness, you know, that we're, we're, we're trying to think like this, but, you know, Cuba has this outstanding history with the United States. And um, I'm, I think we're all sort of fascinated with it. I personally am fascinated with the history. Uh, I love the music. I wish that um, our government was more appreciative of, you know, this little island of wonderful people. Yeah, I also, I can add to that, that it, you know, I tried to make the film a bit more about two cities, not really two countries, like, cause we were there for such a short period of time. And when I get asked about like the political aspects of it, which, you know, we all understand. I, I just talk more about how I compared two cities that have clearly influenced each other culturally you know it's, a, it's and it's so close like that's the funny thing just flying there i was like that was f <laughs> faster than i thought we would get there and i'm always amazed by that like in your the way you think of cuba as far as an american perspective it's like oh it's this commune you know but it's like right there it's so close physically you know it's really funny but I'd love to hear what surprised y'all about your experience there. I mean, obviously we have all these, you know, ideas of what it's going to be like. And, you know, even, you know, more recently, since it's opened up a bit, we've seen a lot more representations of what actual life there um, has come to be. But what, I'd love to, you know, get a sense of what surprised you on your visit. Hmm. Well, I, I think for me, uh... One of the things that really surprised me was how extraordinarily beautiful um, the old part of the city was and what the, uh, the architecture was wonderful. I mean, it was very European and, um, and it's kind of extraordinary. You know, it's really special. It does look, I remember one night we went to a dinner in, ha in Havana and on a rooftop and I mean, really, the, the view at night looks like a set to a film. I mean, it, it, you can't, 
it has such a unique, beautiful, I mean, it's decaying too, which is part of it. And there's some, this amazing beauty, like in the, in the film when Debbie compares it to New York in the seventies. And there's this idea of the past and then the potential for change too that comes So that. I kind of felt that there, you know, but it's so, I mean, it's like a beautiful movie set. You can't believe how the colors too, everything's kind of this amazing faded, versions of these colors, which I was really inspired by. Um, you know, it, it, something that's really moving in the film is watching the audience reactions to the music. Um, and I think, you know, someone in the film kind of questions like which songs people will be familiar with or if people will even be familiar, you know, with the music. And um, I mean, seeing the people lips you know sing along and I think there's I think it's during Heart of Glass you know you let them do the ooh uh, and mm -hmm. it's just I mean it really does speak to the universality of music in a really beautiful and moving way it's kind of surprisingly moving because you see you know concert footage a lot of people singing along but I think there's something particular when it's you know a culture that um, and a place and a people that feel you know have been cut off from our own experience for so long, um, both politically and, you know, otherwise. But I wonder what your experience of, of that was, you know, being in there and, you know, singing and performing to, you know, groups of people who you had never really engaged directly with, you know, personally like that. Um, and, and if that, you know, if, what kind of expectations you had going into it and, and what that was like um, as an experience for you. Well, I had a little bit of an edge on that because we had rehearsals mm -hmm. uh, with the Cuban musicians and um, they were so thoroughly prepared to play with us. You know, uh, I, I don't know, you know, I, I've always, uh, I've always experienced the universality of, of music and the communication through music. So mm -hmm. I, I, I was not so surprised, but pleased. And I know that, you know, over the years, um, you know, there have been other places where I've gone where I didn't expect them to know the music, but, but they did. And I know, you know, I know that if I was a Cuban and I was living there, I would bust my ass to, you know, hear the latest, to know what it was. You know, because I know that there's a, there's an underground and there's a black market and all this kind of stuff, and um, we fortunately, you know, we we participate in that. I mean, for me, what I I didn't know, of course, going in, I had never been there. It's a communist country. All of that stuff. I had no idea if they would know. And I, I I've said this before in an interview, but there was a moment in shooting where I turned, I mean, it was packed, first of all. The whole thing was packed. It was filled with all different ages and all of the, but I looked in the balcony and there was clearly a family, <clears throat> like from, I don't know, the mother, the father, the kids, and then maybe they, all singing. And I realized that this, like, it was so moving. I almost got like teary-eyed because it was just the joy. There was just joy. There was so much joy that they were experiencing the, you know, these songs that obviously, they have heard for now generations, you know, their parents probably played and they were, and they were all singing it. Their kids weren't there like, you know, <laughs> I can't believe they dragged me to this. It's, they were all <laughs> loving it, you know? And that to me was like, it gave me as far as shoot, I was running around with a super eight, but it gave me this like energy that was just amazing. Yeah. Um, well, you so know, I, that's the thing. I loved how, you know, Rob, you know, mixed the, the different, you know, kinds of film and footage. I, I just think that's so incredible. You can you can usually tell what I shot because it's like <laughs> my my cinematographer has a much more steady hand than I do, but I kind of did it on purpose. But it was funny to see the difference. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean the part. I meant the you know, the, it's a different kind of uh, I don't know density, I suppose, right? Yeah, I mean, that's why, I, I mean, I'm so glad we shot on 16 and eight because to me it made so much sense to shoot, to use that lens on where they are right now. I mean, it just made, it just, it was like the lens of, I don't know, time or something, you know, that certain 
aspects of it that they're they're stuck in a certain amount of time but the beauty of that and if i don't know if you noticed that that's those are the only places where animations lie they're never on the digital part and i felt like they were the the, the, the kind of the the lens of the uh metaphor uh, metaphoric and metaphysical that was my idea but i think it worked <laughs> i mean I there's something very it's almost as if you're tapping into like a dreamlike state with you know with the film I mean I and you know both in the way it's shot and the textures and you know the the cuts to the the waves and you know the movement of trees and I mean it, it feels dreamy in this beautiful beautiful way and I think that also relates to the way you've chaptered the film and structured it mm -hmm. um in how one um feels at like these visceral like elemental levels and how we relate to a place and to an experience and i'd like to you know hear hear you talk a little bit about your approach to the structure and um start there and then have a couple follow-up questions about that the structure actually came for two reasons the first was debbie's immediate comment about water she, you know, that she was a water sign and she was born near in Miami near water, which is another funny thing that she was actually born in Miami, which is closer to Cuba than New York. And that got me going about the elemental, you know, mysteries of, of all and all these different elements that come together, which is also very blondy. Like they, they have taken from so many different genres of music and, and made them work together and, and also just a band in itself. A band is like a bunch of different elements that come together and they make this magic. But the other reason was I was originally kind of thinking we would release this online and I would do three little films separate and they would come out, I don't know, a different date. That was just one idea. And then when I put the whole thing together, I realized that it just, it was much better as a, as a complete piece because then you're, you're seeing each element make up the whole, you know, make up the whole. So it's, al it's al you know, alchemy is something that I always think of in my work and the magic of trying to get the, you know, making coal, I don't know, coal into gold. <laughs> you know, it's just, just trying to, what all these elements that make up the bigger picture and then together work well. That's, that's how it happened. But it was mostly because of Debbie's water element sign, <laughs> her. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, I mean, I just, in most of my work, I look for the metaphysical. It's just my natural, I don't know, I, I feel it. Debbie said once to me this interesting thing that I always remember too, when she was on stage, sometimes that she, it's like she's channel, she cha you channel something. I don't know, I can't remember how you phrased it, but you had said like an antenna or something sometimes. It just, this this thing comes through you, which I'm always fascinated by as a, as an artist and sometimes as a performer too. Debbie, is that something that really um, that resonated with you, like the that elemental approach to this experience, uh, looking at it in these metaphysical ways? Well, I think that that's probably the real strong basic reasons that Rob and I work together. Mm -hmm. And we work together well. So um, I don't even think it's a, sort of a question. Um, you know, I, um, I, am a, I am a person who's not especially technically <laughs> astute. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I have a terrific radar. You yes. know, and um, I <laughs> use it. You know, that's, that's it. I have, a, I have a, a good sense of radar. Knock wood that I still have it. Um, but, you know, it served me well, you know, it served me well. Um, I have another question about, I mean, Rob, you mentioned the animation and I think the, you know, the graphics that overlay adds so much to the film. They're, you know, these little bolts of electricity that, that animate um, the footage. How did that come in? How did that come about? Was that something that you envisioned? Did it come about in the editing process afterwards or was it something you were thinking about as you were you know it was the film from the beginning it it actually mm, it came about before for sure but i'm i think it was really about when i decided that we were going to insanely shoot real film um which was a whole other channel i mean there's that 
whole story of like how you bring real film and real film ca cameras into a communist country and hope for the best <laughs> that you know you got what you needed that it the, the film wasn't you know ruined in the scanning and the, and you all the equipment has to be itemized and then um on the way out if you don't have it you know it was all this this real organizational kind of intensity but the fact that it was film i wanted to pay I guess homage or just the, the style of those kind of like late 70s, early 80s filmmakers of downtown, like the no wave kind of the uh, filmmakers who would scratch, you know, um, I'm gonna forget every filmmaker right now to mention because I'm so bad at that. But like um, th these early Super 8 and 16 scratching animations that always inspired me in, in art school and all that, I thought I would, utilize that kind of technique or, or make it look like that technique but everything in there is for a reason there's no it's not decorative just decorative they're all symbolic everything <clears throat> is related to the next thing it's you know it, it highlights of course what you're trying to the visual but they all mean something i love it I think it's just such a it's such a beautiful added touch that kind of brings the city alive in a way that um, uh, is really special and unique. Right. I mean, there's also an element to the film that I think um, I couldn't. I just kept getting so wrapped up in, but like the streetwear that you you capture in the film, I feel like you have such an eye, Rob, for fashion and for you <laughs> well, know for for picking up on those little you know small small pieces yeah. throughout the film but i mean that's just that's also nick weisner who's my cinematographer and we both were shooting and he he has a very he's another one who has a very similar take like i do you know we we, we get along really well and he gets it yeah there's a funny there's this, there's a boxer who we and nick okay. speaks that yeah he speaks spanish and i don't really so he got thank god he got to talk about it. and there's a boxer on the he went into a boxing gym and they wouldn't allow him to shoot in there. But one of the boxers was like, you can shoot me on the street. So he's wearing this fila, you know, and it kind of made me think about, again, like we were talking about, I don't know if it's culture, but like these brand, American brands that they get there somehow, you know, or it's, it's probably not a real fila t-shirt, but you know what I mean? Like, and so the same is with music. They, they've gotten all the music somehow, you know throughout the years and they get these things and it's just the fun I loved that shot because of the Fila you know logo and him boxing because it was just so I don't know it just said so much to me um I, I feel like uh you know in the film I think it's you Debbie you talk about the, the you know the crumbling nature of New York in the in the 70s and the beauty and its decay and how that um that felt very familiar in when you were in Havana. And I mean, when you're saying all that, it's hard for me not to think of New Orleans and, and what's around me because I, you know, that is, I think, part of the beauty and allure of New Orleans as well. And I, I don't know if you've ever been to New Orleans or what your experiences in the city have been, but um, I'd love to hear, hear if that is something that, you know, you, you, you think about when you think about New Orleans as well. Well, Debbie has to at some point tell you her New Orleans New Year's Eve performance mm -hmm. story because <laughs> it's really good. I'm but, all yours. I but you can yours. answer that when, you know, <laughs> however you want. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't know, you know, what to say uh, about my personal involvement with New Orleans, but I, I was there many times. And, uh, you know, of course, um, you know, writing on Desire and, you know, we had a <laughs> the, the driver on the get on the wagon, get on the wagon. <laughs> and, you know, it was just, it was wonderful. It was perfect. And I, you know, got to explore some neighborhoods. And then I was there for um, when uh, Tarantino was shooting uh, Django. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, he was shooting in one of the sort of flower districts, very old, you know, beautiful place. And, you know, they had covered the uh, street in with sand. So it looked like it was, you know, an unpaved street and, uh, you know, with horse and wagon and, and 
you know, the whole thing was uh, just wonderful. So, you know, what you were saying before about time and, you know, maybe, you know, layers of time, you know, are really, it's all simultaneous. It's all happening at the same time. And, you know, we get to benefit from that. Um, so uh, I don't know what else I'm trying to say, but, um, but New Orleans and New York and, and definitely Havana and many other places, you know, have uh, the benefit of this layering. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, we're all fascinated by it and we, uh, some of us love it and some of us really hate it, um, but it, it causes a reaction. Yeah, New Orleans is one of the, that's why I love it so too, because it still maintains, you can't say it's like any other place, which is very rare now. You know, that, that gets harder and harder to say about certain places. And it has maintained its, <laughs> its own thing for a long time. And it's, it's also, I always think it's also kind of like, because it's like a swamp below sea level, it's such a crazy place. <laughs> It's like, there's, there's a vibe that's like, woo, you know, this is like one of those, maybe like Debbie was saying, like maybe it's some kind of like, you know, geographic thing or something that is pulling, but, but you have to, I won't let you leave this without telling them your New Orleans, I just remembered that, your New Orleans, um, was it New Year's Eve performance, right? Yeah. <laughs> Tell them that story. Tell them the story, it's so good. Oh, it, it was, um... It was a New Orleans gig and it was a, a track date. So I was singing live to my own tracks and um, I was wearing my razor blade dress, my floor length double edged razor blade dress that Michael Schmidt made for me. And it had, you know, all the blades were sewn on, sewn on so that, you know, like when I moved, it was like a, a snake skin. And, but the blades had some life in them. They weren't completely dull. And, you know, one of the, the sort of fun things about wearing it was that, you know, I would have little nicks and scratches here and there. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm up there doing the show and it was, you know, it was wild. It was a great night, full, full house in this club. And, you know, everybody's, you know, dancing like mad. And, and I, I'm up there snaking around and all of a sudden all the power cut off. It's not, not a light not a sound, nothing, just, just me standing there with all of these arms creeping up my dress, you know, because I don't know, but it was so psychedelic. It, it, was, it was fantastic. I've never had anything like that since. But we all had a good time. <laughs> when did, did, did the lights, the lights eventually did come back on, yes? Yes, well, that's, that's sort of when I, I mean, I could feel them, you know, coming up me, you know, feeling up my, my dress and everything. But then when the lights came on, it was like, everybody was like this. <gasps> <laughs> they were copping a feel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know what it was about, but it was, uh, it was very unique. <laughs> like New Orleans. Well, power outages are uh, a fact of life here. I feel like we get them probably more than anyone else in, in <laughs> Um, I have just a couple more questions, um, and they're more about, you know, kind of your art and practice. One, I mean, you know, both of you have been performing and, you know, working within art spaces for years. Uh, and this is a question we ask, um, you know, everyone, but what drives you as artists? What is it that, you know, pushes you forward and um, what drives your creative practice? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, you know, I think about it more often than I probably should, but uh, I guess I'm, I'm on the wheel, as it were. You know, I, there was a time in my life when I wanted to be somehow exercising artistic, uh, an artistic nature and creativity and, um, you know, went at it. And I think, you, you know, you have to be mad you know stark raving mad really and uh <laughs> <laughs> that's what and i was then, gonna say <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and you know you you know it's um 
it's a lifetime's pursuit. You know, I don't think it's you it can enter into it lightly. You know, it, it's, um, it's a real dedication, and it, and it is, you know, um, a great state of mind. You know, um, it liberates you from a lot of things, but it also, you know, channels you, and but it also can be um, extremely you know, can cause a lot of depression and, um, you know, fear, you know, it, it's a struggle, you know, to survive. Um, that's the downside. I, I, I think I already said what the upside was. So, you know, it's a, it is a toss up as with, you know, everything in life. I, th I mean, I, I agree completely with everything Debbie said. I just think that for me personally, the the drive is always the mystery, you know, <laughs> like what, what drives you to do this? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> I wish some days I could just cut it out of my brain so I could have a more, I don't know, simple life. I'm not sure. But um, to me, it's like, that's the ultimate, that's actually a lot of the questions that I ask in many of my work, the, the metaphysical, what is that? What is this and what is inspiration? Why is it torturing me? <laughs> you know, why is it making me have to go put yourself out there? Because you're basically, you know, putting yourself out there for judgment and all of that. But I think, I, as this just came to me, almost every time I do something, whether it's a, and that's the thing with me is I do so many different kinds of things, like theater and film and performance. And, and I like the new, I think I'm interested. I think curiosity drives me. I'm very curious about things. But after each one of them, there is inevitably the moment uh, at this point in my life where so, the one person comes up and says the exact thing to you that you were hoping to get across. <laughs> and it's usually just one, it only takes one person in a lobby after a show or even maybe an email. And that's when I know that I've done the thing I intended to do, which was communicate something, uh, you know, make someone feel the, the, the thing I intended. So I guess that keeps me going too, that I'm, it's like, okay, that touched someone in the way I hoped. And I'd like to do that again in, you know, and it, it, it means that what I'm doing made made sense. You know, you're not like, I, I mean, you're, even with all the criticism you'll get, if you get that one person who understands it on the level you were intending, then you're like, okay, that was worth it. <laughs> yeah, that's beautifully said. Um, and this is the last question, I'd be really quick, but uh, what's a film? I mean, this is a film festival. Curious if there's a film that you've seen recently that you really loved. Oh, well, we just came back from the Reykjavik Film Festival and I really liked, um, oh God, I'm gonna forget, the, the, the worst person in the world. Um, I, I really liked it. I, 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 and I met, he was there, uh, um, Trier, and he's a really wonderful person, but he, um, there were things in that film that have still stuck with me that I thought were really well done. So that's mine. Yeah. We're showing that as part of this festival, actually. Oh, is he coming? <laughs> is he going to be there? No, he's not. He's not. He's a busy man. Yeah. What, have you, yeah. You know. what have you seen, Debbie? <laughs> well, I guess the most obvious thing is the latest uh, version of Dune, which has been raked over the coals more than enough. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the books are wonderful and, you know, the interest. Uh, I would suggest, you know, reading those books, um, you know, and letting them corrupt your imagination and uh, inspire you. I, I don't know, you know, great, great fiction like that, great science fiction is a, a, a great, such a great resource, you know, for letting your, letting your brain go and, you know, just, be crazy and you know it's it's all fun you know it's all wonderful debbie and i have both known some sandworms in our time that's for sure <laughs> 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 well um thank you so much for uh speaking with me today and thank you for sharing the film we're so honored to have it in the festival and to share it with audiences here through the new orleans film festival
Oh, it's so, I'm so happy and proud that it's there. My favorite city. Yes, yeah. we're both very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well, you. thank you both so much. And thanks to everyone for, um, for watching the film and, and, and the Q&A. Uh, I'm coming down. I'll see you there. Great. Absolutely. You're welcome. Bye. All right. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. Jazz hands. <laughs> <laughs>